Um, so hi everyone, happy December. Uh, I know this is a very busy time of year for most people, so thank you for joining us on the virtual Red Bench tonight. Uh, for any new viewers in the audience, I'm Abby, the Executive Director at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, the Red Bench Speaker Series is one of my absolute favorite programs at the museum, and it's my hope that if you're able to support this series, you'll make a donation tonight. Not only does it help keep this series going, but you're supporting our overall operations. This year, the museum is 34 years old, and we're also celebrating our 20th year in Stowe. So if you believe in our mission, enjoy our programming, or find value in our location in Stowe Village, please support this series, our year-end campaign, or consider becoming a member. I have two pairs of Darn Tough ski socks that I'll raffle off tomorrow. Each donation in increments of $10 earns you an entry. Donations that were made prior to tonight and our Red Bench Seasons Pass holders are already entered. Uh, thank you to our Red Bench Series sponsors, Silver Sponsor Scholar Textile, Bronze Sponsors AJ Ski and Sports, RK Miles, Sisler Builders, and our media sponsor, Vermont Ski and Ride. Tonight we have Vermont author Skylar Bailey and military historian and native Vermonter Brian Lindner here to talk about Skylar's recent book, Heroes in Good Company. Brian's father and two uncles were members of the 10th Mountain Division and Skylar is the grandson of 10th Mountain Division veteran Everett Bailey. We have signed copies of Skylar's book in our online shop. You can head over and get your copy. Orders placed tonight will be mailed on Monday. If you have questions for Skylar and Brian, please type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And Brian, I now hand this over to you. Oh, great. great. Thank you, Abby. And uh, welcome everybody to uh, tonight's event. Uh, I think this should be a lot of fun for folks, very informative. Uh, and first off, I, I hope everyone that's, that's tuning in tonight will also support the museum. Uh, it definitely serves a major function in the history of skiing here in Vermont. Uh, I brought my personal check tonight to turn in uh, when the event is over with uh, as a contribution. Um, and tonight what we're going to do is have a conversation with Skylar Bailey uh, about his new book. I personally was fascinated by it. I think I've read all of the books in the 10th Mountain, and uh, I have not read a bad book yet. Uh, each one of them is really good in its own right. But Miller's uh, book, uh, I really felt like I was in the foxhole, uh, really firsthand information on the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, it was a page turner. I couldn't stop turning the page and just reading. It was, it was that good. It's really a top-notch book. And as Abby said, you can get them here from the museum. So um, let, let's start off. Uh, uh, just a little bit of background. Um, I first became uh, aware of Everett Bailey, uh, Skylar's grandfather, doing research on Stowe Mountain Resort. I saw his name as one of the original members of the Sep Rush Ski School. And it turns out there were 16 men that served at Stowe Mountain Resort, employees of Stowe Mountain Resort right here in Stowe and were also members at some point of the 10th Mountain Division. So 16 veterans served on Stowe at the ski area, my dad, uh, my uncles uh, being some of them. And Everett Bailey was in separate ski school. He was featured uh, in two or three postcards that I'm aware of. One of them is a very famous postcard. You can see it out on eBay all the time. And Everett Bailey and um, a guy named Fritz Kramer were the only two that worked at the mountain first and then entered the 10th Mountain Division. The other 14 came back to Stowe after the war was over, having served uh, in the 10th overseas. So having said that, uh, let me introduce Skylar. Uh, and uh, good evening, Skylar. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, tonight we're going to have just kind of a conversation uh, with Skylar uh, about his book. And I, and I guess the first question is, uh, tell us about your connection to the 10th Mountain Division. Sure. Um, so really at this point, the book is kind of my primary connection to the 10th Mountain Division. Um, so my grandfather, Everett Bailey, was uh, in the 10th. Um, he enlisted uh, in the Army in the spring of 1942 uh, and trained at Pine Camp, New York uh, for a little while and then joined the 10th Mountain Division. He got his letters of recommendation 
and joined the 87th at Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, trained there on Mount Rainier, uh, was part of the NTIS field group, and uh, then went to Camp Hale, then trained at Fort Ord, California, and then took part in the invasion of Kiska, Alaska in August of 1943. The 87th remained at Kiska uh, longer than my grandfather did. He left early to go participate in a army rock climbing school at Seneca Rocks, West Virginia. Uh, and he stayed there until the 10th went to Camp Swift. So he also missed the D series, uh, but reunited with the 10th uh, at Camp Swift, Texas, where he took command of Company L of the 86th Mountain Infantry and served with them in Italy. Right, and, and the book centers around uh, his command of Company L. So it's quite, it's quite a specific topic and we follow him and his troops throughout the combat uh, overseas. And, and your book really picks up at the point of arriving in Italy in combat. Almost all the other books of the 10th Mountain Division, uh, extent, they spend a lot of time talking about the training at Camp Hale. And, and if I can just put, add a little history to this, Camp Hale was a location um, west of Denver in Colorado. It was an entire uh, army base built just for the 10th Mountain Division. And you'll hear Skylar talking tonight about uh, the various regiments there. There were three regiments in the 10th Mountain Division, 85th, 86th, and 87th. So it sounds like your dad started off in the 87th at Fort Lewis before there really was a 10th Mountain Division. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, grandfather, but yeah, so he- Grandfather. Was um, so he was initially in the 2nd Battalion of the 87th. Um, and so they sort of, 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, they um, sort of formulated them in, in order, basically. And uh, so he was kind of one of the, not the earliest, but among the early uh, ski troops that were in training. Okay. And at Fort Lewis, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, this is the foundation of the ski troops in the United States. And to practice rock climbing, they basically had a gravel pit or a sand pit. Uh, they didn't even have a rock face to practice on. Um, so um, maybe you should talk a little bit about the training at Camp Hale in the D series because it was so famous. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, at Camp Hale, there was uh, kind of a variety of training programs. The D series was the most famous and um, and it, it was basically going out into the mountains in freezing cold in deep snow conditions. Um, and in theory, they were they were practicing military operations. Uh, a lot of them sort of describe it more as just trying not to die. Um, there was a lot of cases of frostbite. It went on for quite an extended period of time, weeks. Um, and uh, my grandfather, probably luckily for him, missed out on that operation. Um, he was also a part of the home state maneuvers, which was sort of another series of, of these that came a little bit earlier. And, um, and sort of all of them kind of had this going out into the snow, building snow huts, um, sort of the, the men of L Company, aside from my grandfather, did participate in the D series. And uh, some of them describe in great detail building uh, igloos, sort of cutting chunks of snow and building little houses and, and then building kind of a, a roof over the top. Um, Bob Creer and his squad uh, got buried in a blizzard while they were in their ice hut and uh, their sergeant couldn't find them in the morning. And so the, the company marched off without them and they woke up realizing they'd been left behind and had to scramble to, to follow everybody along. Uh, but it kind of the men of the 10th really kind of experienced their greatest freedom. Um, you know, the 10th Mountain Division was comprised of largely skiers, rock climbers, hikers, outdoorsmen. Um, that was sort of the core underneath it. And for them, this was like out in the mountains with the guys um, skiing and, and doing the things that they loved. And so even though there was training involved and it was it was hard, um, it was also 
dovetailing with their passions. Mm -hmm. And the, the most famous maneuvers they had were the uh, D series, where it was far below zero, for, literally for weeks on end. Uh, and I know I've heard veterans say, and also I've read, uh, multiple times that they felt if they could survive the D-series maneuvers, they could survive combat. Yeah. That's how rough it was. Um, okay, so, so your book really picks up after uh, Camp Hale. Um, and you mentioned a little bit in the book, I believe, about uh, Camp Smith in Texas. Uh, you you want to talk about that just a little bit before we get into the, the, the uh, content of your book? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so after their time in Camp Swift, the 10th Mountain Division was sent to Camp Swift, Texas. Um, so they went from very high altitude, uh, freezing cold, trying to survive in the snow to uh, 90 degree, high humidity, uh, low altitude. Um, and a lot of them kind of had some serious physical effects of that. Um, my grandfather lost a great deal of weight. Uh, at one point, his wedding ring fell off of his finger. And someone behind him kind of had to point out, hey, I think you dropped something. Um, they there were sort of filled out um, with a lot of new troops. When they went to Italy, one third of the men that went with them had never been to Camp Hale, had never done any of the mountain training, had joined them at Camp Swift, didn't know how to ski. Um, so there was sort of this core of, of mountain troops with other people who just kind of got sent to them. Um, early in their history, they did not have heavy weapons companies. So the standard infantry formation would have uh, a battalion of three rifle companies and then a heavy weapons company, which would have sort of larger mortars and 50 caliber machine guns, and they would act as support for the rifle companies. And the 10th Mountain Division, wanting to be more mobile and have greater flexibility in difficult terrain, didn't have um, the heavy weapons companies. At Camp Swift, they activated heavy weapons companies. They got all of these new men. They were training in flat, hot areas. The things they were training in were, you know, digging foxholes and running around and kind of more military maneuvers on flat ground, um, which gave rise to widespread belief that they were being turned into a flatland infantry division and being stripped of their, what they felt, elite status as mountain troops. Mm -hmm. um, and they stayed there from about June, July of 1944 until November of 1944, when they left to go to Camp Patrick Henry um, in Virginia for their embarkation. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was in Texas when they were finally issued the rocker that went above their shoulder patch that said mountain, which basically... Um, showed that they were elite troops. They now had the mountain rocker uh, above their arm patch. Um. <laughs> yeah, it was in Texas when they were renamed the 10th Mountain Division. Um, prior to that, they had been the 10th Light Division, the 10th Light Division Alpine, kind of variations of that. Um, and they really kind of became the 10th Mountain Division. Um, and they got their famous uh, badge with the crossed bayonets approved for them and the rocker approved for them. And General George P. Hayes became their new commander, who sort of seemed to really appreciate what what they brought to the table, uh, as distinct from other divisions with the, uh, within the army, um, and did a lot for the morale of the troops. Yep. Now they're about to embark to go overseas for combat. Let's back up a little bit about the the actual men that are, that were in the tent. I have long understood that it was supposed to be the most highly educated. Uh, division in the U.S. Army, uh, the most advanced degrees, that sort of thing. Uh, tell us about uh, your grandfather's work experience and educational experience but, uh, prior to the 10th. Sure. Uh, he was born and raised in Wells River, Vermont. Uh, he was actually born across the river in New Hampshire, but we don't tell people that uh, in the family. Uh, he, uh, uh, but he, was, he was raised in Wells River and then as a child moved to Burlington and uh, went to the University of Vermont, where he majored in electrical engineering, um, was on the ski team. He met my grandmother while he was coaching the women's ski team. And after graduation, he moved to Pittsburgh uh, to do some electrical work. And then the war started and he went into the Army. Okay. And now 
the your story about well let me back up your book kind of begins at this point they're they're ready to go overseas they're going to head for combat and <clears throat> which makes it different from the other books or most of the other books on the 10th mountain division who cover so heavily the earlier days of the 10th and talk about maybe a little bit about um how you got interested in writing this book sure <clears throat> so i mean i had known as a child that my grandfather had been in the 10th mountain division it was not really a secret um it was something he never talked about and that's kind of been a common theme with a lot of the families of veterans that i've been in contact with throughout this project is they just they didn't talk about it and Everyone in my family, I think, assumed he had told other people things. Um, and then as they started kind of talking to each other after his memory went, they realized, no, he hadn't really told anyone anything. And growing up as a child, you know, your grandfather was in World War II. You would imagine there would be stories, um, you know, as a child, not understanding the trauma behind it. I, I guess I assumed he drove a truck or something like that. And uh, I was talking to my grandmother, and and she mentioned... Um, that he'd won a silver star medal. And that seemed like something people who drive trucks don't do. So I kind of, that intrigued me. <clears throat> and then in the fall of 2011, I took a, a class in college. I went to UVM as well. And it was a really introductory history class on United States history from 1865 to the present. And the final paper that we had to write was how some event in the 20th century impacted someone in your family. And I thought I can put together five or 10 pages on, you know, my grandfather in World War II and what his life was like after that as a result. Um, and as I started looking into it, I started at the Denver Public Library where they have a 10th Mountain Division archive. Um, I got his service records from them, the citations for the Bronze Star and the Silver Star that he was awarded. Um, and, and just started looking into it rapidly fell down the rabbit hole. Um, it was, <laughs> I, I, there was, at one point, I was 18 pages into the paper, and I went to my professor after class one, one day, and I said, how long are you looking for? Um, and he said, well, what do you mean? Like, just, just, you know, just a paper. I said, well, I'm, I'm 18 pages in, and I'm not really close to done, so, like, do I, do I cut it at some point? Like, will you stop reading after 15 pages? How, how long a paper do you want? And he, he said, write until you are done. And so I turned in a 25 page paper at the end of the class, but I wasn't done. And so I, I kept doing research and I kept writing, thinking that I might compile all of this into some heirloom that the family might be able to pass down found out what uh, what my grandfather had done, and, and that could be sort of things that were known within the family. And it got to a point where uh, it, it had sort of ballooned into 150 pages. Um, I found more and more sources from other people who were in the company and realized these people are all at least as interesting as my grandfather. And um, that actually, in a lot of ways, they're more interesting because they're telling you the story. It's their words, and it, it kind of has this visceral hold when you hear uh, someone who was there and who experienced it describing what it was that that they lived through. And so um, the rabbit hole got deeper and deeper, and I kind of woke up one day and realized, like, I think I wrote a book, um, so I, I'd better, like, start looking at it as a book and, and try to organize it along those lines. Um, at that point, I started uh, compiling more and more resources, right? So I, I kind of went through it methodically, and um, I, I got a book by Horton Durfee, uh, who had been the um, one of the communications guys in the company. Um, Bob Creer wrote a, a memoir. I got his memoir. Um, the battalion surgeon wrote a book. I got hold of that. Um, there was an L Company history written by a man named Bob Carlson, who had been in L Company. And, um, and so from there, I got into DVDs of oral histories uh, provided out of the Denver Public Library. 
um, company morning reports, which are um, sort of daily logs of events, casualties, who's coming in, who's going out, how many men are there, um, which over time kind of create an interesting look. Um, and um, German unit histories. I got medal citations for all of the guys in the company who had been awarded medals for things. Um, <clears throat> I got in touch with Italian historians and archaeologists, and they sent me articles and sort of things they had explored and done that that had been part of the, the company's experience. Army histories, core histories, regimental histories. Um, then I came upon sort of a windfall in a box of chocolates at my grandparents' house that when opened uh, revealed letters. Um, and so it was all the letters that my grandfather had written overseas and sent home. Um, well, then I reached out to the Denver Public Library and said, I want letters from, from other people too. And so a lot of the sources are from that time, right? So when you sort of the most comparable book I can think of is sort of a band of brothers thing, which was based largely on interviews done decades after the fact, when people have had a time to contextualize things and um, sort of put things into a box that they can live with from then on. Um, Bill Morrison was a veteran that I got in touch with. He sent me some um, short stories he wrote in like 1946, 47 to process, excuse me, what had happened to him. And when they are writing letters home or processing it immediately after the fact, it lacks that context. Um, it's still raw. It's still something they're grappling with. Um, and so, yeah, just getting all of those sources, short stories by Norman Goldenberg. Um, then I started writing to these people. I started tracking down which veterans are still alive and wrote to all of them. <clears throat> Interviewed a couple of them um, and just started everything I could find uh, went into the book until it was sort of this really detailed day by day account of what they did when they were over there and how they felt about it and how they lived with it and what they cared about and what they fantasized about when when whenever it was they might get home or not. One of the things that uh, I, I enjoy the most in your book is the firsthand reporting from the front, uh, raw, unedited, like, here, honey, this is what happened today. Um, in reading it, one of the things that I experienced was at some points was the fear that these guys had. I mean, they, like the next day, they wrote down what happened. Uh, and maybe you could speak a little bit to the emotional part of, of what they're writing home. Sure. One of the things that I find really compelling about the book and was really interesting to me about the project, right? So what comprised the rabbit hole that I fell down was that you get to know these people. Like they each kind of bring something different to, to their experiences. And so it, it impacts them each differently and they each take something away from it that's different. Um, you know, someone might kind of have this very sarcastic, bitter feeling about some of the things that are happening to them. Um, you know, Norm Goldenberg typically kind of has this very biting uh, sense of humor around what he's experiencing. Someone like Bob Creer talks about um, finding out President Roosevelt had died and feeling like, well, he died in a warm bed, didn't he? And, you know, we're kind of in this hole and this hole is the world. <laughs> and anything outside of the immediate sphere just is a million miles away. Um, sometimes there was dishonesty. There are times when um, I have letters from my grandfather uh, writing to my grandmother saying things are good. It's not so bad. Don't worry. Um, but I know where he is. That, that it's dated. So I know what day he wrote that on. And I know what was going on on that day. And he was lying. Um, he didn't want her to worry. Uh, it, it was really bad. He was under shell fire constantly. And 
they were out of food and they'd been under attack for a week. And he's saying, don't worry, it's fine. Um, Bill Morrison talked about um, charging across an open piece of ground and one of his men getting wounded and stopping under fire to take care of the wounded man because the man was calling out, you know, don't leave me, help me. Um, and and getting yelled at afterwards by the lieutenant for stopping under fire to help somebody. Um, that sort of these these experiences that maybe over time become more general are very specific in the moment. And they'll talk about specific friends of theirs and what they saw happen to them. Now the, the army debated the 10th Mountain Division uh, for literally for months about how do we use these guys? They don't have tanks, they don't have artillery. All they got is light weaponry. They're trained for mountains and cold weather. What do we do with them? And it was finally uh, uh, General Mark Clark who said, wow, this 10th Mountain Division, we could probably use them here in Italy. Um, what was the problem in Italy that they needed the mountain troops for? Um, there were mountains. And um, basically the, the war in Italy was marked by um, Germans in fortified positions on high ground. And every time the Allied forces broke a hole through the German line, there was another one just as strong, not far behind. And um, not only that, but by 1945, the German army in France is a shambles. Uh, the German army in Poland and Germany is rapidly being destroyed by the Red Army. Um, meanwhile, in Italy, the sort of the balance of forces has never been more in Germany's favor. And the troops that are there are sort of the most experienced, least damaged that they have left in the field. And so um, <clears throat> I think Mark Clark really kind of understood that the 10th Mountain Division had special capabilities that he could use strategically. And so um, they kind of came to the front, um, took up post on parts of the line, conducted some patrolling operations, got a little bit of experience, um, engaged in the Riva Ridge operation, uh, which is very famous, um, scaling up almost sheer cliffs at night, overwhelming German forces at the top, and then holding the heights against determined counterattacks that went on for several days. And then the Mount Belvedere operation, <clears throat> which L Company was part of, and suffered more casualties in than any other company in the division. And sort of those early experiences reinforced the view that the 10th Mountain Division had capabilities that could be put to good use in mountainous terrain. And so they were the spearhead of the spring 1945 offensive um, that broke the German lines in Italy and went across the Po River Valley. Um, they were kind of the, the spearhead. They suffered more casualties than any other unit during that phase of the Italian fighting, um, but broke the, the German line. So talk a little bit, if you would, about these guys uh, in Italy in World War II, the 10th Mountain. They're, they're advancing on the Germans who are fortified in the higher elevations. Um, they're not advancing through forests. They're pretty much out in the open uh, and your, the photos in your book that, that, that you selected really show how exposed they were going uphill. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about these guys advancing a little bit, digging foxholes, trying to get a little sleep, a little food. Uh, uh, what were their experiences like? How, how, how did they handle that? Sure. <clears throat> um, I think it varied over time. I think at first it was quite shocking for them. Um, the men of L Company... Uh, had been in a couple of firefights um, during the period of patrols. So they came to the front, took up a, a part of the front line, which basically consisted of, um, you know, sort of a center maybe in a small town and then fortifying some houses around that small town and giving them names, um, you know, 
lion, bear, things like that, rattlesnake, and <clears throat> just sort of holding the front, going on patrols. One of their patrols was ambushed at night. Um, then they uh, had some attacks from some German forces another night. So they were getting some, you know, skirmishing with enemy forces, um, digging foxholes, taking watch, um, sort of trying not to be visible during the daytime. Those kinds of experiences they were getting. Uh, but it wasn't until the attack on Mount Belvedere that they kind of were in some major combat operations. And almost all of them describe it as really a turning point in kind of what they were doing. Um, whenever a friend that I, you know, one of my friends buys the book, I always warn them about chapter five. Um, you kind of feel like you're reading one kind of book for the first four chapters, and then uh, about halfway through chapter five, you realize you're, it's a really different book maybe than you were prepared for. Um, being under mortar fire and realizing that the deep snow is absorbing the concussion and the shrapnel. And so you're slogging through the snow, really slowly cursing it, but it's also the thing that's saving your life, um, according to Bob Creer. And um, just coming under intense fire, um, they all describe artillery fire as being the worst thing um, because there's nothing you can do about it. So in great detail, several of them talk about lying on the ground, tensing every muscle in their body, hoping they don't get hit, but imagining that every shell is coming directly at them. And then the shell lands somewhere, they realize they're okay, and they try to relax for a second, but then another shell's coming in pretty quickly after that. Um, Bob Creer got trapped in a barrage when his foxhole was just deep enough that he could lie in it and the top of his back was under the ground level. Um, and he kind of talks about um, probably going into shell shock while he was sort of huddled in this hole with shells lying all around. Another one describes the feeling of the shock wave going over his back and feeling like it's it's tearing the flesh on his back because it's just so forceful. Um, they talk about digging foxholes uh, to survive and how their foxholes evolve over time. Right, the army teaches you how to dig a foxhole, but very quickly they realize there's a principle behind it, and you can dig a small hole at the top and a, a chamber underneath, and oh, hey, you can put little cubby holes in the walls maybe to, you know, put a candle or a hand grenade, and um, they talk about sort of adjusting to that life, um, adjusting to uh, not really getting hot food or any food at all. There was a period um, on one mountain where all the supply routes were being shelled. And so they were just stuck up there and they ran out of food and they ran out of water. Um, the commander of the battalion, um, Jack Hay, described in an interview decades later, um, and he was tearing up as he was talking about a soldier cutting, uh, finding a, a loaf of bread on a dead German soldier that had been well soaked with the German's blood. And he's kind of cutting off the not bloody pieces and eating them because um, there's no no supplies coming up. So they're they're up in the mountains. It's cold. There's snow there. Um, they really weren't on skis. This was an infantry war. Uh, they were fighting on foot. Uh, how did these guys stay warm during uh, combat? Yeah, they had they had clothes, um, and th they didn't stay warm. Um, you know, they didn't have the supplies that sort of the mountain stuff didn't really come along with them. Um, there are accounts of um, people sharing blankets, multiple people sharing a foxhole and really kind of cuddling up to stay warm. Um, two people getting one blanket to share and, and cuddling. Um, after the first day of battle, one of the soldiers talks about digging a shallow foxhole and building a small fire right there in the foxhole. Um, so and staying warm during that kind of early period was a constant struggle, um, especially at the front. If they're in a town, they might be, you know, billeted in a house. Um, so that would have been more comfortable, but out in a foxhole, it's just try as best you can not to freeze. So this was really a rifleman's 
war. There's it's mortars and rifles uh, with some artillery coming over. Uh, these guys really didn't have the backup of what you think of normally with tanks and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the things that you did cover in the book that, that I was quite interested in, and you've alluded to it here was uh, the food. Yeah. Uh, what did they do for food up there? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, uh, C rations, B rations, 10 and 1, K rations. They would kind of get um, through the normal supply chain um, food that would come standard army food from World War II. Um, the, the cans of food from sea rations could be traded. So there were locals. The Italians still lived there most of the time. Um, and they would sort of trade and barter cigarettes, cans of food. Um, the, the soldiers described their interactions with the Italians as they had money enough. They weren't poor people. They were okay. But the food rationing that the Germans imposed on the population was so stringent that a lot of them were really hungry. And so when the Allies took pieces of land, they were also taking the citizenry that lived there who was, so had been on kind of borderline starvation rations for a while. Um, and so they were able to trade um, non-perishable food in cans, which was highly valued by the Italians, uh, for potatoes or spaghetti or, um, and they kind of describe being able to conjure together some pretty tasty meals with this combination of things they could trade. And of course, wine was everywhere and they were always trying to get their hands on some local wine. And uh, mules, as the mules would die, they'd get cut up and there would be mule steaks. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe speak a little bit about the mules because they trained so heavily with mules here in the States mm -hmm. and then left them all behind. Uh, it, or most of them at least, and once they got over there, they had Italian mules. Yep. Uh, and what did they add to the 10th Mountain Division? <clears throat> so initially the idea was that these would be really alpine, high mountain, really rough terrain um, troops. And so lacking road networks, there could be pack mules that would supply the men. And so they all trained in, in mules and um, while they were in the States. And in fact, when they were talking about you know, when the rumors were going around at Camp Swift that they were going to be turned into a flatland infantry division, um, Stuart Abbott writes on, we still have our mules, right? So it was kind of like, they haven't taken the mules, so we must still be mountain troops. And uh, when they get over to Italy, um, you know, there were times when they couldn't get supplies. And so they started training with the mules again. Um, there's accounts of sort of mules just sort of showing up in camp one day, and they're kind of dealing with the mules and relearning how to, to do the mules because, um, of course, there's attrition. Um, so of the troops that served in L Company in Italy, almost half of them were replacements. And so they might have come from any other division in the army or they might have come fresh from home and they would just get slotted in to um, fill combat losses. And so... As they're getting ready to do the April offensive uh, out of the mountains, they're they're retraining in mules, and one of them apparently went flipped and sort of fell all the way down the hillside, much to the amusement of all the men who who got to see it. And then they took the mules away, and there were sort of mule droppings all around their foxholes after that. Um, <clears throat> but the the terrain they fought in in Italy, while a lot of it was steep and a lot of it was rough and a lot of the principles of mountain warfare they were able to kind of bring to that environment. There were towns and there were road networks. It wasn't, you know, remote, um, rocky, craggy places. It was inhabited landscapes. Now, the 10th lost more men uh, in a shorter period of time than any other division uh, of the U.S. Army in World War II. Close to a thousand men uh, were killed in action. I'm not sure what the number was of wounded. Um, and you've talked about it, how the uh, the core uh, they started with basically two thirds of the veterans at tra Camp the Trade Camp Hale, and another third were replacements right up front. How did morale uh, last during all of this rugged combat with the replace the heavy casualties and the the, the numerous replacements coming in? 
I think they still viewed themselves as special. Um, I think they had variable views on on the replacements. So some of them were proved to be excellent soldiers and were sort of adopted and did just fine. Um, others talk about kind of a slower period of acceptance. Um, Private Lloyd Fitch <laughs> talks about joining L Company as a replacement and kind of being told over and over by his sergeant that you know, you're not going to last five minutes once we start the spring offensive. They made him the point man for the platoon, so he's kind of way out front, um, kind of as a sacrificial lamb. Whenever they had a dangerous job, they're going to fetch and saying, hey, we need our canteens refilled. Hey, can you go check out that farmhouse? Um, finally, he got fed up and just said, don't ask me to do these things anymore. Um, and then he was kind of one of the guys after that. Um, my grandfather wrote a letter home not long after the war ended, so just after the April offensive. And he is describing, you know, the outfits changed a lot. Um, it, there's a lot of new faces, and it's it's a different thing than it was, you know, even three months ago. But it's still the best battalion and the best army in the world. So um, they still viewed themselves as something special. Now, your grandfather's letters, obviously you quote heavily from them. Uh, it's another way that you've put us in the foxhole on the front line is through his eyes and his letters to your grandmother. Did those letters evolve and change significantly in tone as the combat proceeded and he lost more and more of his men? Yes. Um, yes. So there's definitely a period of adjustment and you can kind of see that in the letters and that's kind of one of the things i really wanted to to kind of do with it is what is the experience as a person of going and, and doing that we sort of idolize the 10th mountain division a bit and turn them into sort of marble figures of superhuman um military might from from that generation um, but a lot of the forces in this book really poke holes in that and show them as just being a bunch of kids who were scared, who did amazing things in spite of the fact that they were like deeply human. And um, the letters that he that my grandfather wrote home kind of are one way of getting a window into that. He, he talks about um, when he first leaves, how much he misses my grandmother. Um, clearly, then there's a maybe a period of jealousy, and then then he kind of adjusts. And in one letter, he says, you know, I'm here, you're there, it's okay. Um, then things start getting really dangerous, and sort of the fun stories of what's going on around him stop. Um, there was a period where he would talk about trips he would go on, um, taking a Jeep ride to some farmhouse to try to get some wine off of this person who spoke no English, and, uh, you know, getting drunk uh, on the way back to camp in the Jeep. Um, <clears throat> those sort of stop after the Mount Belvedere operation. Um, there's one really striking progression. As they're getting pulled off the line, he wrote something like, you know, all of those stories you hear about soldiers that can't wait to get back to the front, none of that's true. We don't ever want to go to the front again. We're really, really happy to be leaving. Um, like two weeks later, as he's away from the front, sleeping in sheets, he's thinking about home. He doesn't have sort of the present distractions to keep his mind from, from wandering. And he says, I, I can't, if I go back to the front, it'll be okay. I won't have to think about it anymore. And so just the transition of no one ever says that to, he's literally saying that over the course of two weeks. Um, reading the book, as I say, it was so well written and just fascinating. It's such a good read. There was one thing that stood out to me, um, and I found that the way you told all the stories highly credible. But one thing that stood out to me was uh, the soldiers that you talked about specifically when they were killed in action, uh, the vast majority of them seemed to be killed instantly. And do you think there's a possibility that the, the vets that told you the story just 
didn't want to tell the full story, so he didn't suffer. It was very quick. Uh, or do you feel that that's really what happened? So I think it depends. Um, you know, uh, Bill Morrison talks about watching a couple of people uh, be killed during the Mount Belvedere operation. One of them he describes as kind of being shredded by a mortar round um, and sort of watching him go into shock and um, kind of linger for an hour. Um, and so, you know, if Bill Morrison's going to tell me someone died instantly after that, I'm going to believe that person probably died instantly. Yep. Um, when Ben Duke is writing to Stuart Abbott's mother and saying, I firmly believe he never knew what hit him, I might have some question about that. Um, but there are several other accounts from other people about Stuart Abbott being killed. All of them universally describe it as being very instant. Um, so, you know, maybe that's true. Lewis Wesley was uh, killed by shrapnel while sleeping. So, um, he, you know, as peaceful as it could be, I suppose, for him. Um, Norm Goldenberg talks about some people not, not quite dying right away. Um, so that's certainly possible. I don't know that I've found a specific one that sets off alarm bells for me as, as being suspect uh, in the book. Okay. Now, your book did something that really struck me, and as you really covered the story, once the 10th Mountain Division pushed the Germans back and pushed the Germans back and pushed the Germans back and they got to Lake Garda, your book really covers what happens around Lake Garda. Uh, to an extent that I hadn't seen previously. I, I learned tremendous amounts from, from your research and the way you wrote it up. I wonder if you could just cover a little bit about Lake Garda and what happened there. Sure. Um, so Lake Garda is a large lake in northern Italy. Um, it's pretty narrow and very long with steep mountains on either side. And the 10th Mountain Division um, sort of came to the southern end of Lake Garda and then had to advance up the eastern shore of the lake. And there was a road that ran right along the lake shore um, that at several points cut through sheer cliffs um, in a series of tunnels. The tunnels were numbered by the army um, and the Germans blew up the first couple tunnels and collapsed the roofs down. And so they had to use um, duck, uh, D-U-K-W, um, amphibious craft to sort of get around these two blown tunnels. Um, you know, up until that point, the 10th Mountain Division had had lots of air cover. Um, they'd had good artillery support. Occasionally there was armor support, though not, you know, not all the time. Once they passed those, those blown tunnels, no artillery is coming with them. No armor is coming with them. It's basically if it's not on boots, it, it doesn't make it around these two tunnels. Um, on the other side of the tunnels, there's sort of further tunnels with machine gun positions carved into the rock. Um, these were all fortifications dating back to World War I. And um, they, they had to kind of take these tunnels one by one. Um, there was one tunnel, um, which has kind of gone down in history as the Tunnel of the Dead. The Americans named it that when they got to it um, and discovered that a German platoon heading through the tunnel had accidentally detonated some um, demolition charges while they were still inside. And so the mountaineers arrive and there's sort of this pile of um, people and they named it the Tunnel of the Dead. Uh, the advance continued up the lake, uh, third battalion of the 86th in the lead, uh, with L Company along the road, and I and K companies kind of finding a mountain traverse to try to get off of the road. The Germans have some 88 millimeter uh, artillery positions at the northern end of the lake, and they're kind of shooting constantly at the Americans as they advance. And at one point, they fire around directly into uh, the tunnel of the dead while um, the better part of two companies are sheltering inside. The round goes directly into the tunnel, blows up inside the tunnel, and, um, you know, 
the number of killed and wounded is is remarkably low, but I think initially everyone had some kind of concussion. The first medics on the scene described going into a smoke-filled tunnel, literally tripping over people who are on the ground in various states of incoherence. Um, one of those who was wounded there was the commander of 3rd Battalion. And at that point, my grandfather replaced him as commander of the battalion um, and tried to lead them in the attack on the town of Corbole at the northern end of the lake. But there were communications problems due to the terrain. The radios weren't, um, they were just out of communication with each other. Uh, the attack became disjointed. It took some time to get things organized. And by the time they made it into the town, it had gotten dark. And so the only remaining advantage left to them, that of air cover, also went away with nightfall. And so at that point, as it hadn't really before, um, it became a war of mountain troops as infantry against enemy infantry with all of the advantages the mountain troops had had taken away from them. They managed to capture the town. No sooner had they done this than the Germans counterattacked with about 150 infantry and three panzers, German tanks. Um, and they sliced into the town, firing into the buildings. Half of Company L was um, surrounded and cut off from the rest of the battalion, which sort of fell back to the edge of town. And the rest of the night was spent trying to disable the German tanks and trying to break through to the to the kind of surrounded group. Um, they eventually did, and the Germans withdrew, probably because they ran out of ammo. Um, but you know, this was a an area where I discovered that this had happened. I also read all the Tenth Mountain books and and kind of loved them all in their own way. And it just wasn't really in any of them in any substantial way. And so as I was discovering this, I I decided this is a thing that needs to kind of be brought to light. And so I wrote an article that was published in the University of Vermont History Review in 2014. And kind of through that, the Italian historians and archaeologists uh, came out of the woodwork. And um, Ben Appleby especially sort of wrote to me and said, I agree with your position on the 20 millimeter gun that was used. And uh, he, he shared with me some videos they had taken inside of a bunker carved into the wall of the Tunnel of the Dead and some of the artifacts that they found there um, and some articles about German dead that they had found and where they had been buried. And that sort of became the basis for my estimates of how many German losses there might have been um, in the fighting in that area. And that's, of course, where, um, you know, the, the famous Colonel Darby, uh, he was killed by an artillery round in Torbalay after the Americans had captured the town, and it was just sort of the last German artillery round uh, killed him and, and Sergeant Major Evans. Well, you did a marvelous job of telling that story in the book. It's like I said, I learned so much from it. Um, <clears throat> we're getting towards the end here. Um, the can, can you tell us the story uh, of the two young girls that were sentenced to death by the Germans? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, rationing was pretty stringent. Um, and, you know, the, the Germans had their own supply problems and their own food issues. And the Po River Valley was the breadbasket of Italy. And stripping Italy of its food to bring north uh, for German consumption was part of the reason the Germans held uh, Italy as far south as they did. Um, instead of retreating to the Alps, where they already had prepared defenses from World War I, they fought in the Apennines for, you know, 18 months, um, largely to preserve the Po River Valley within their supply sphere. And um, there was a, a couple of young ladies who were out delivering unrationed bread to the hungry. I believe one of them was going to become a nun. Um, and they would sort of at night sneak out and go from house to house um, delivering these loaves of bread. And they got caught by the Germans and were arrested. And they were brought into the town of Arco, 
uh, which is just north of Torbay Lake, up the valley. And um, they, you know, punishments were fast and, and you know, tough at the time. And so they, they both imagined that there might be a short trial in the morning and then they'll be killed uh, by the German forces. Right. So in the last couple pages of your book, when I was reading it, uh, my eyes popped out when I read the name of my brother-in-law, uh, retired Colonel Al Lewis, Alby Lewis, uh, from the Mountain Warfare School. And he's sitting next to me this evening, and I've asked him if he would come in and just, uh, I mean, you tell it really well in the book, but this is a great opportunity for Alby to tell the story of that you relate in the closing of your book of what happened uh, with those two young girls. And so I'm gonna turn it towards uh, Alby here. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Brian. And first of all, it's a, a great pleasure to be here at the Vermont Ski and Snowbird Museum. Uh, to be able to talk a little bit about uh, this side of your book. I had the great pleasure of meeting your grandfather uh, he was a guest speaker at what we called Dining In uh, when I was the executive officer of the Mount Battalion uh, with the Vermont National Guard. Uh, during those years, I spent a lot of time in Northern Italy uh, and became very close friends with an old Italian Alpini soldier, uh, Luigi, who I called Gigi. And uh, as it turns out, his mother was one of two of those young ladies uh, that we were sneaking out at night uh, delivering bread after curfew. And you're right, the Germans were very, very quick in their judicial system. In fact, uh, uh, those that get caught uh, were summarily shot uh, the next morning at eight o'clock in the town square. Uh, it didn't matter your age, uh, sex, uh, or anything. Uh, there's still a monument in Arco uh, because of that. Uh, and that particular location, uh, just north of Varco and Kerberle, of course, is the Brenner Pass, which is the key pass into Austria. And uh, so I spent quite a bit of time there, got to know Luigi very well. And Luigi had invited me to his mom's house for dinner. So here I am going to dinner. I, I'm, I'm thinking it's just a simple dinner with his, with his mom, uh, Luigi, maybe Luigi's brother. Uh, oh no, I, I get there and uh, the table is a long table lined up with the mayors, uh, two of the towns, Turbley including, uh, Arco, uh, the regional general, uh, mayors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and throughout the meal, uh, just a wonderful meal, I'm at one end of the table as the invited guest and uh, uh, Luigi's mom is at the other end of the table. And as we finish dinner, she gets up to make a speech. And I can speak a little bit of Italian, but uh, when you spoke like she did uh, passionately uh, with, with a lot of fervor, uh, it was hard to follow. And as she spoke, uh, she kept pointing to me and she would become more and more passionate. And finally she worked her way down to the, to the end of my, the table where I was pointing to me. Uh, and she's so passionate, tears are running down her eyes and she kisses me on the cheeks. And everybody looks at me and claps. And I looked at Gigi and I said, Gigi, what, you know, did I just marry your sister or what, what, what's going on? And he said, no, no, she's, my mom's thanking you for saving her life. And I said, Gigi, what are you talking about? And he proceeded then to, to tell me the story that, uh, that they had been captured and were going to be executed. Well, two months later, I was back in the United States at, at a battalion dining in. And your grandfather was a guest speaker. And he spoke uh, specifically about Turbolet and, and driving to Arco to try to uh, secure the Brenner Pass, which at that time was the key entrance into Germany or into Austria. Uh, and he talked about uh, the independent action uh, that, that he was able to do, uh, his command and control and his authorities. Uh, and it just spun my head to hear that he he was in charge of the unit that, that drove up uh, along uh, Lago de Garda uh, all the way to, to, to Arco and freed his mom. 
So I got up and offered a toast and told him, you need to know the rest of the story and told him that story. And of course, he afterwards, he came up and shook my hand and said, you know, there were a lot of second order of effects that, that we just never knew. And, and after all these years to hear, hear this, uh, it, it just it, it brought a, a great joy to his heart to hear that. Uh, the final sequence of that was I was back in Italy two months later. I saw Gigi and I said, yeah, you tell your mother that I met Captain Bailey uh, and uh, the commander who actually saved her life and was able to pass along the thanks. So it kind of closed the book on that. So thank you. Excellent. Th 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 thank you, Albie. And, and Skylar, you told this, that story so well at closing in your book. Before we uh, get to question and answer, maybe you could just very briefly talk about reaching the Po River and the surrender of the German forces in Italy. Sure. Um, so, One of the kind of strange historical ironies, I suppose, is that around the time they encounter the, the German dead in the Tunnel of the Dead, um, there's a conference going on 150 miles south of them, by which all of German Army Group C uh, surrendered to the Allied forces. And um, it was decided that this would take effect in 48 hours. So for whatever reason, they decided 48 hours from now, Army Group C will be surrendered. Um, no one at the front was told this. Some of the veterans described sort of this feeling of bitterness of, you know, I think Bob Creer put it as, we would have played the game differently had we known. Um, it definitely all of the, the fighting around the tunnels, the, the 88 millimeter shell, um, the battle at Torbelay, all of that happened after the armistice had been signed. Um, but before it took effect. So, of course, Luigi's mother um, owes her life to the fact that they weren't told, but um, but they weren't told. And um, as they kind of passed Lake Garda and went further north toward Austria, um, there were Italian resistance fighters that kind of came out of the woodwork. And um, so a lot of it kind of turned into peacekeeping, you know, trying to keep the, the fascists and the the other Italians from seeking retribution on each other and um, the Germans retreating as fast as they can to Austria. Uh, there was sort of a miscommunication where the Americans were under the belief anyone in Army Group C, whether they were in Italy or Austria, would be surrendered. And the Germans seemed to think, once we cross the Austrian border, we're no longer subject to the surrender, that it only applies to uh, the German army in Italy. And uh, so they're kind of rushing as fast as they can, trying to, to get away, and the Americans are following them. Um, and Dave Brower, who was the um, sort of maps guy in, in 3rd Battalion 86, he describes in his book, um, sitting at the, at the radio, at the CP, and uh, someone calling the radio and asking for, um, for Remount Blue, uh, the, the the commander of the of the battalion who was my grandfather at the time, and so he he gave the phone to my grandfather, and uh, he, he describes my grandfather as sort of jerking up in his seat and saying what, and um, the orders repeated, and he just turned to Dave and smiled and said, "The war is over in Italy," um, and sort of as it kind of percolated out to the troops, they were sort of struck and. A lot of them sort of pinching themselves and not really knowing what to do with it. And I think that's one of the things that really marks this story as a really human story is, you know, Bob Creer described it as like, how can you, what do you even think? Like, this is too big a thing. What do you say about this? Um, someone else sort of mentioned, like, you feel like the bottom has fallen out of everything. Your whole reason for being just evaporated in front of you. And now what do you do? Um, you know, and and then they start thinking about all of their friends that they've lost and the things they've done, the things they've seen, and realizing they're going to have to pick up the pieces of that and and then go on with life now. Okay. Um, is there anything that uh, we, we that I didn't ask that, that you would like to add back in now that because I forgot to ask it? 
Um, no, I think you did a great job. Okay. All right. Well, the, the book is fantastic. I do see we have some, some questions. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, my father was Bud Phillips with the 86, uh, 86 uh, Regiment Company F. Uh, it was at the dedication of Camp Hale in October when Biden dedicated Camp Hale as I live in Aspen, Colorado. My father was a ski school director at Mad River Glen after the war. He also skied in the Roach Cup in Aspen in 45-46, which is now the FIS World Cup ski race returning to Aspen in March. Uh, two downhills and one Super G race uh, for men. So not really a question, but a, a comment. And uh, yes, I remember when Bud Phillips was the uh, ski school director over at Mad River. Uh, another comment, uh, I visited the museum's 10th Mountain Division exhibit, and this conversation really brings to life some of what I saw there. How many 10th Mountain Vermonters actually went to Italy to fight? Um, do you know the answer to that, Skyler? I don't know the answer to that. I think um, Abby may know the answer to that. I think she had, had put it somewhere, but I can't recall the number. I know there were six killed. Um, yes. Six Vermonters were killed in Italy. Um, I can't recall how many served. Yeah, I want to say it was a couple hundred, 250 maybe Vermonters in the 10th. Uh, and the Vermont Ski Museum inducted all of them into the Vermont Ski Hall of Fame a, a number of years ago. Um, uh, so uh, one of the uh, folks would like you to tell the story about the photo that's behind you. Sure. Uh, so I don't really know much about it. It came out of the Denver Public Library archives. It's a very kind of famous picture. It's on the back cover of the book. Um, I don't know who the man is. I don't know if anyone knows. Uh, I'd love to find out if somebody does. One of the great things about this project um, is I also have a blog uh, called The Rucksack, and I kind of started that in 2015, kind of to tease the book and just kind of see, I don't know, how different writing styles kind of work with audiences, I guess. Um, and people just kind of came out of the woodwork. I got a lot of my source material from families of L Company veterans who reached out to me um, during the process of this. So uh, Lewis Wesley's um, family reached out to me and, and I wound up uh, being in contact with uh, his younger sister who gave an account that's included in the book of um, how she found out her brother had been killed overseas. Um, so if anyone comes out of the woodwork and tells me who that guy is, I'm thrilled. Um, but that the, the name of that mountain is La Nuda uh, because it didn't have any trees on it in 1945. It's had a lot more trees on it now. Um, and it's just outside the town of Vitichatico, uh, which is right near Riva Ridge and Mount Belvedere. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that photo also really shows how exposed the tenth was, and every time it advanced, uh, they weren't hiding behind trees. Uh, they were right out in the open. Um, we had one uh, question, uh, excellent question. What was the hardest part of your writing progress? Who? Um, there were a couple of, of things. I would say one is tone. Um, I went through a period where I thought I was going to write sort of a, a, it would be more of a narrative style. At a certain point, I, you know, I had to accept the fact that the veterans say it better than I do. Um, and so I kind of had to rewrite the book, getting my own voice out of the way as much as I could and just sort of letting them tell their story in their own words. Um, cause it just felt like me making stuff up, even though it's based on what they said, they just say it better. They were there. Um, there was also a series of sort of moral dilemmas that came around through the writing of this book that I kind of had to make ground rules for myself on. There was a period where I was going to abandon the project. Um, I felt very much like none of these guys had talked about what had happened to them. And so I felt like I was doing something wrong, like I was telling their secrets, like I was digging into their private life and sort of sharing it when they didn't share it. Um, and that just felt gross for a while. I, I didn't like that. Um, and then a couple of things happened. So I, I decided um, I'm going to abandon the project and I'm going to focus on my other passion, which is early Vermont history. And so I started by pulling out the uh, 
the, the history of Newbury, Vermont, and I opened up to the preface. And the first thing in it uh, talks about a historian in the 1830s trying to put together a history of the town's experience during the American Revolution. Um, I happen to have the quote in front of me, and it, it the, the quote from the book says, he lamented that all who had borne an active part in those events had been allowed to pass away without any pains being taken to gather from them the full particulars of those years, and that in consequence of that neglect, the time had passed when a complete history of the town could be written. Um, and I kind of realized I have a unique combination of sources at my disposal, and it's possible no one is ever going to be in this position again, not in the same way, and that I, maybe I have a responsibility to tell the story because maybe no one else is going to get the chance. Um, and 50 years from now, someone might say, if only we, you know, had this. Now we have writing and there's it's been preserved better, I hope. Um, but that's that kind of struck me. And then I was writing back and forth with Bob Creer, who was a sergeant in L Company. Um, he and I had quite a lengthy correspondence. Um, he was a really wonderful guy. And um, he, he kind of encouraged me. He said, what you're doing is really important. And let, you know, I'm really glad that you're writing this book. And please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. And I kind of took him up on his offer. I said, well, I need a foreword for the book. And so he provided the foreword. Um, and that kind of made me feel like, you know, someone needs to tell the story. Bob's okay with it. Uh, so I, I kept writing. And then as I got in contact with more and more veterans and interviewed a couple of them even, um, I started to feel differently about it and felt much more comfortable. Other moral dilemmas included, like there are things in this book that maybe we wouldn't want to think about our grandparents. Um, there's sort of issues with like emotional maturity that we might not imagine. Um, there's war crimes occurring in the book, what we would describe as war crimes. Um, there's instances where people are maybe engaging in behaviors we would call cowardice, sort of fleeing in the face of the enemy and refusing to go back to the front, um, self-inflicting wounds so that they can get out of service, sitting at the edge of their foxhole, listening to wounded people, and just kind of shrugging, and you, you, someone will help them, maybe, but I'm not gonna, um, and being very candid about that. And it's sort of that, that human element, I think, that puts the heroism of what they did do into such stark relief. And then there are things like people visiting prostitutes and who had families even. Um, and I kind of had to decide if the person telling the story named the person, then I could name the person. If they didn't want to name the person, I decided I wasn't going to do it for them, even if I could figure out who it was. And when you're only talking about 200 men, you know, researching them for 11 years, you, you kind of know a lot of them. And the same names come up over and over and over again. And I could usually figure out who was who. Um, and if, if the source didn't say, I decided I wasn't going to go there either. So another question was uh, being so close to these events with your grandfather, such uh, such a big piece of what you were able to learn and uncover. What was it like for you emotionally to write the book? So, <clears throat> you know, I, I knew my grandfather as an old man, as a very soft spoken, gentle uh, old man. Um, the things that I found out he did. I mean, I cried when I found all of this out because it just, it didn't strike me that that was him. Um, and so at some point I kind of had to decide, there's my grandfather who we call Pops, who I met, who I knew um, and interacted with. And then there's Captain Bailey, who is this historical figure, who is someone else um, who I didn't meet. 
um, who I never interacted with, and I never, I never saw that person. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen for just one second here because there's a picture that I have that's. Uh, So if you can see it, this is um, Captain Bailey. This was a, a drawing he had done while he was on leave in Rome in March of 1945 uh, and sent home to my grandmother. Uh, I ended up with the original. Um, and the other picture is, that's Pops. That's, you know, and, and to me, they were really two distinct figures. And I really tried to write the book fully utilizing the sources that I happened to have because he was my grandfather, but without, I didn't want a reader to read the book and recognize immediately, this is a book written by the grandson of this person. Um, you know, I majored in history in college and I care very much about history as a academic pursuit. And so I tried as best I could to distance myself from it a little bit to tell the story. Um, but yeah, there were definitely times where I was impacted, not just by what he went through, but by the other people that I met. One of the guys that I got to interview was a guy named Ed Lachandro. And he was, when they went to Italy, he had been in L Company longer than anyone else. Uh, he'd grown up in Queens, New York. His father was a cabinet maker, and so he'd grown up making cabinets with his father um, and didn't know how to ski. So one of the things is the three letters of recommendation kind of went away after the 87th. By the time L Company was being activated, really all you had to do was say, hey, I want to go to Camp Hale and train with the 10th. And you were on a train. Um, and so he went there and he kind of joked with me about writing his own letter of recommendation. and. Um, and so then he passed away in March of this year. He was actually the last person that I know of from L Company who was still alive. Um, and that kind of affected me quite a bit because talking to him didn't feel like talking to someone my grandfather's age. It was like when you're talking to him, all of the decades disappear and it's just two equal people talking about things. It felt very natural. Um, I see a comment here from uh, Val Rios. Uh, his dad was in 87th Regiment Company K. Uh, and if everybody can see it, he's posted a link for photos that his dad had taken. Uh, and I recognize Val's name from the 10th Mountain Division descendants. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but I think the 10th Mountain Division is the only American division that has uh, its own nonprofit association formed by its uh, the next generation and it's now down into the third generation so you're two generations down from the 10th mountain it's called the 10th mountain division descendants uh, association which is quite active i, I might add yeah um, i will also <laughs> say that the, the number of people that came out of the woodwork due to the blog who were grandchildren of descendants uh was pretty remarkable um mm -hmm. You know, I would post a photograph on the blog and the grandson of the guy who took it would send me an email saying, my grandfather took that. I have a whole album of them. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a neat thing, but it, it didn't, it's not just the children and the, the nieces and nephews. It's it's really gone multi-generational at this point. Yep. yep. Um, how, did you, uh, how did your research and what you learned impact your view on the war? Um, you know, the thing about history is it's always more complicated. And as much as I love every book about the 10th Mountain Division that I've been able to get my hands on, if you're writing a book about a division of 14,000 people, you can kind of pick the story you want to tell and find the sources to suit it. I'm not saying that that's what happened, um, but it just... The, the, the amount of source material that exists with a subject that size can be overwhelming. And so the impact of the decisions the particular historian makes is going to be maximized because of the volume of source material. It's where you're looking. That's where you're going to, that's what you're going to find. 
once you narrow it down to 200 people, every single source becomes hugely important. And so it, it allows for a more holistic view. It allows for a more nuanced view. It allows for every single thing about their service jumps out. And, um, and you do see them as just a bunch of kids who did extraordinary things, not because they were extraordinary necessarily, um, but because they were put in the position to do them. And that's what made them extraordinary is, is kind of what they went through. Um, I was surprised to find that not only were, you know, by the time they got to Italy, one third to one half, not mountain trained at all, but there were times when that helped them. Um, L Company sent out 50 men one night and they left on snowshoes because it had just snowed. They quickly discovered that a lot of the guys on this patrol had no idea how to snowshoe. So they just ditched them and went on foot. Uh, the guys in front kind of wading through waist deep snow and the guys behind in single file line kind of following along through the snow trench. When they got ambushed, they all just dropped. And so they disappeared. Um, the Germans had no one to shoot at. If they had been on their snowshoes, they would have been stuck on top of the snow and probably would have been cut to pieces. And it was because they didn't have the mountain training necessary to utilize the, those skills that allowed them to get away without any loss. Um, you know, and, and that was something that struck me. Um, the German accounts, kind of who they were, I tried as hard as I could to sort of tell the story from the German perspective as well. Um, and kind of give that full picture of what's going on in their in their world. Who are they? What do they care about? Um, their foxholes are not that far away, and you know they're living through the same conditions. And uh, the battalion surgeon <clears throat> was fluent in German, and so he left lots of accounts of talking to German prisoners. And um, you know the. The Americans were all very interested in who their enemy was and what their enemy was like and um, what motivated them um, or didn't. Um, I see Valvias has a couple more comments here. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone, especially Skylar, to join us next year in the 10th Mountain Division Descendants 2023 Return to Italy trip. Uh, they do this every year. I know my uncle, one of my uncles was on one of the very first trips where they went back to Italy uh, following the war. Uh, Val also said, thank you, Skylar, for continuing to tell the story and legacy of the 10th. I'm sure your grandfather, and I would add all 10th Mountain veterans, is smiling from above. Semper Avante. Um, there, there's another question here. Uh, were 10th Mountain soldiers older than most soldiers today? Your comments about education makes me think perhaps they were older. Uh, I'll take a stab at that and you correct me. Uh, I suspect, I've never seen the statistics, that the 10th Mountain soldiers in World War II, the original cadre anyways, probably were older because they had, um, I would say most of them already had some sort of career. They were already uh, mountain guides, ski instructors, ski patrollers, etc. So I suspect that in average, the 10th Mountain guys were older than the normal 18, 19, 20-year-old soldiers that served in most other divisions. So this is a bit anecdotal. I think probably you're right. Kind of that first group in the 87th was probably largely college graduates, um, kind of more in their 20s than sort of your average infantry. I think the next group tended to be maybe young and dumb enough to think I can do this, even though I don't know how to ski. I'll, I'll go there and I'll learn how to ski and I'll be able to do it. Um, and so a lot of them were 18, 19, 20. Um, maybe had some outdoor experience, maybe not. Um, you know, I'm thinking Stuart Abbott, uh, Bob Creer, Ed Lashandro, uh, he had no mountain experience. He had dropped out of high school. So in a division of educated people, he didn't have a high school degree. He got his GED after the war. Um, and then as they're at Camp Swift and starting to get lots of draftees and new men, um, then they start getting some older troops and Stuart Abbott writes home saying, you know, we're getting all of these new guys and they're all in their late twenties and 
they're not going to be any use in the mountains. I don't know why they're giving these guys to us. Um, and uh, it's it's around that time Kurt Kreiser gets sent in, and he was Austrian, um, had grown up in Austria, was a master tailor. He had trained Austrian mountain troops. Um, when Hitler took over Austria, his family left and moved to Ohio. He was drafted, and it took exactly 10 days from the day he was drafted uh, till he arrived at Camp Hale, because um, they realized it, the army realized immediately, oh, well, you're going with these guys. He was 31, and he was one of the oldest men in the company. Um, one question. Uh, did I read somewhere that the creation of the 10th Mountain came together over dinner one night down in Manchester, Vermont? You know that story? Uh, yes, you did read that somewhere. Um, it's actually very well told in Morris Eiserman's book, uh, The Winter Army. Uh, it, sort of the beginning of his book is a, a really great um, explanation of why the U.S. Army, why uh, Minnie Dole <laughs> uh, was able to convince the U.S. Army that we ought to have some winter and alpine troops um, and kind of how that came to be. And yes, it was um, in front of a fireplace in Vermont. Okay. Uh, this, this next question comes from Elizabeth Bailey Mitchell. Hi, Skylar. This is your cousin, Elizabeth May. Love your book. My dad would have loved it too. Question, in chapter two, you mentioned that at the front lines, there was an agreement to not shoot unless the other did. Why was this? It just makes life harder for everybody. You know, you're out there, it's cold. Um, life at the front isn't fun. And so they just sort of, you don't shoot at us, we won't shoot at you. Um, Bob Creer talks about, you know, every once in a while they throw a couple of artillery shells at us to keep us honest. And, uh, you know, if they started really exposing themselves, they'd, you know, lob a couple shells at them. Um, they talk about shooting artillery shells at them at, sort of specific at the same time every day um, so as not to hit the enemy. Uh, they'll know it's coming and we'll shoot over there where we know no one is. And then they won't shoot at us. Um, that was kind of during the winter of, of 44 to 45. Um, then the front became static after the Mount Belvedere operation. So March to April. Um, and at that time, it was a very different experience. Um, there had been an offensive operation you know, the shooting war was was on. And so there were snipers and there was um, kind of daily artillery barrages meant to cause damage. Um, and so there were sort of two, two experiences, but the winter front definitely, um, they, were, they were just trying to get by. Um, a story my uncle told me once, he was in uh, 87 Company K, I think it was, and he said he was sent out on a detail once to meet with their German counterparts and said, okay, we won't turn off your electricity if you don't turn off our water. And they shook hands and then went back to their own sides. Uh, Crystal Bailey said, uh, how did you come up with the title of your book? Sure. Um, so initially the, the working title had been 3,000 hours in Italy because uh, it just was such a day-by-day -day detailed uh, telling of their story. Um, Throughout the course of the, the blog, um, I became keenly aware that if you titled an article, you know, Blood, Guts, and Snow, um, no matter what it was about, way more people would read it uh, than if you titled it The Interesting Conundrum of Historical Reality Between, like, <clears throat> somewhat to my chagrin sometimes. Um, and so I was realizing I needed to come up with a new, a new title for the book. Um, and then I found a quote from the commander of the 10th Mountain Division that said, if you're going to risk your life, you may as well do it in good company. And there it was. Okay. Uh, Doug Schmidt sent a comment to uh, Skylar. Thank you for telling your story, this story in your book. My great grandfather, Robert Hayek, also served in L Company 86 and was a veteran of the modern, uh, and as a veteran of the modern division myself, I'm happy that you took on this project as these stories need to be told. So great comment there from Doug. Uh, 
Uh, William Holland had a comment. I think it's important to point out that the casualty rate of troops who landed on D-Day for some units approaching 99% was vastly greater than it was for the 10th, simply because they were continuously in combat for so much longer. Uh, and that's true. Uh, you can make statistics, say anything you want. I think that the one that I was mentioning was uh, if you take the same comparable period of uh, days in combat, it was the 10th that lost the most of any division uh, in World War II. But uh, thank you, excellent point made. Uh, Poppy Gall uh, said, uh, thank you, Skylar and Brian, for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Look forward to reading Heroes in Good Company. Uh, Poppy, you will love it. It is a great book. Uh, if you'd like to post this, please feel free, but uh, here's a link to a website that I put together. It is a work in progress, but it lists a lot of books and digital text about the 10th Mountain Division, and Doug Schmidt has included a link there. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, and uh, a good question from uh, Lori. Has your grandmother read the book? Did she have a uh, chance? Nope, she did not. Uh, so... My grandfather passed away in 2014. She passed away in 2016 um, without ever reading the book. Okay. I talked to her about it a lot. Um, <clears throat> she did learn some things, um, but was never able to read it, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, what characteristic of your grandfather that you discovered in writing of the book do you wish or hope you would find in yourself? He seemed to be pretty meticulous and quite a planner um and in 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 my life there are times where i kind of look to him and think um what would pops do and he also seemed to have you know pops the guy i met is not you know captain everett bailey but all descriptions of of captain everett bailey talk about him being um high energy uh driven and um, I think there was a story passed down through the family where maybe he hadn't done something quite to, uh, to his battalion commander, Jack Hay's satisfaction. And Jack Hay said, you need to be more slam bang. And you could kind of see that urge to be more slam bang in kind of how he was. And so whatever that term means, I, I think about that a lot. Um, uh, Matt Fitzgerald, a uh, retired member of the Mountain Infantry, said, uh, what do you think the legacy of the 10th Mountain will be going forward? I do not know. That's for them to carve out. Okay. Um, Tom Moran, uh, in your research, did you ever come across a name, uh, I'm going to struggle with this, and what, Juano Contillo. He was my grandfather from New Hampshire who was a Finn and wounded in Italy. If I remember correctly, I think he was in the 86th Company, 86th Regiment. He passed in the mid-1850s. Did that name ring a bell or come to light during your research? Um, it doesn't ring a bell. Um, you can go to my blog and find my email address and shoot me an email, or you can just Google 10th Mountain Division name lookup, um, and that will give you a, a list of every man who was in the 10th Mountain Division and what regiment and company they were in. And if he was in the 10th Mountain Division, you'll find his name. Okay. Uh, William Holland, again, a comment on the contribution of foreigners, uh, refugees, etc., to the success of the 10th. Good point. Yep. The uh, guys like the Alpini, the Italian Mountain Troops, uh, foreigners definitely uh, participated. Uh, any others that I'm not aware of? Uh, with the mountain troops or just yeah, the, in general? with the 10th. Yeah. Um, there were Brazilians that were next door. Right. Um, they weren't in the 10th, but um, they were sort of very much with each other. One of the things that I learned throughout the course of this project is that the Brazilians also really value the 10th Mountain Division history. And mm -hmm. they seem to have kind of their own narrative of it. And maybe I think there might be some subtext that there's a feeling of having been cut out of the story. Um, during the Mount Belvedere operation, the 10th Mountain Division very famously captured Reba Ridge and Mount Belvedere and Mount Della Taracha. Well, right next door, the Brazilians were right alongside capturing their own objectives in the same offensive operation. Um, so a lot of them have come out and supported sort of the broadening of 10th Mountain Division history. And a couple of them have said, you know, we were there too. 
Uh, Ken Lawson asked a question. Now, th this is an entire book in itself. Were the dead from the 10th Mountain Division buried in Italy? Yep, uh, a lot of them were. So uh, Stuart Abbott is, is there. Um, there is a um, cemetery in Florence uh, where a lot of the 10th Mountain troops ended up. Um, a lot of them ended up coming home as well. Um, was it you who sent me the photograph of Lewis Wesley's grave? Yes. Um, in Rochester, New York, his body yes. was brought home. Um, so it was kind of, I think, up up to the family a little bit and up to the the fates where, where people ended up. Mm -hmm. I know of the six Vermonters uh, that were killed in action, I believe five came home to be buried in Vermont and one is still in Italy. Um, uh, Barry Goodman asks, uh, Les Billings of the Mad River Barn told stories of the 10th skiing with the Germans right after the armistice. Do you, do you know about that? I don't know about that. Uh, I do know about um, sort of this very rapid uh, letting the Germans keep their weapons because uh, they were afraid that the, um, the Italian resistance would um, <coughs> seek retribution on German soldiers. So the Germans were allowed to keep keep sidearms. Um, they started directing traffic for the American forces, and so there was a bit of interaction there, but uh, I didn't know about the uh, a mutual ski trip. If anyone knows more, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, Maria Gray asks, uh, you mentioned earlier how you warned friends about Chapter 5. How did writing and researching the happenings on Mount Belvedere affect you? Um, so the process of doing the research is sort of slow and methodical. Um, you often feel like you're making a collage. So you're sort of taking a piece from this, taking a piece from this, finding out how it is that they fit together, uh, maybe filling in some connection with my own words and then finding another piece of something else. Um, so it kind of happens slowly as, as I'm piecing it together. Um, I... I did feel like the first time I read through it, because you sort of read it and read it and read it. How does it flow? Okay, I got to change this. Okay, now up, up, this. Nip, nip. Um, there was a moment where I read it and was just like, this is terrible. Like, this is this is awful. <laughs> um, you know, having assembled it and then seeing it all in one place like that. It, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Crystal Bailey asks, why did you self-publish? Um, I, so Crystal actually has a friend, uh, Shannon Munson, who kind of urged me in that direction. Um, she'd done a lot, of, she'd done some self-publishing and sort of talked about how, you know, we're in the 21st century now and things have changed and, uh, it's increasingly a perfectly acceptable way to go. And, and so that's, that's the route I took. Um, I also was feeling very much like, I wanted to get it out there and I, I didn't want to take a couple of years um, to delay it going through more traditional routes. I felt like I know there's an audience for it. Um, I've got a blog and people started writing to me saying, hey, when when is this going to be a book? Um, and so I just kind of decided, let's let's get it out to the people who want it. <clears throat> Um, here's a, from Francis Noel. Here's here's another one that could be the subject of, a, of an entire book. Uh, what do you know about Walter Prager? Um, not a ton. He was not an L company, uh, so I wasn't sort of a huge Tenth Mountain Division um, historian prior to embarking on this project, and so um, sort of a lot of my knowledge was acquired as I went along. Um, kind of learning about different weapon systems and and structures and things like that um, kind of came along as I went. I think that sort of incorporates itself into the book in a way that people who maybe haven't read every book about the 10th Mountain Division, um, people who maybe are, are not, who are maybe new to the field, uh, there's enough basic information included to provide an orientation as you go. Um, so you're not expected to know what a CP is. I'm going to tell you it's a command post and then start using CP. Um, things like that. That is an example that, um, you know, kind of is a primer as well as an in-depth dive. Okay. Uh, Val Rios sent a, a comment here. Uh, thanks. This is very helpful. He said approximately 
325 10th Mountain Soldiers are buried in the American Cemetery near Florence. Um, and then the last one we have is uh, from uh, MJ Fitzgerald again, uh, a retired Mountain Soldier. Uh, I got to visit the military cemetery in Florence 2007 with Dick Wilson, uh, Company G86 Regiment. Recommend going there for anyone visiting Italy. Can't begin to describe how powerful an experience it is. So thank you, Matt. That's a great comment. Um, so um, Skylar, again, I want to compliment you. A fantastic book. The, the research was incredible. Uh, your writing style, just everything about it. It's a page turner. Uh, I hope folks will, will all flock to purchase your book. Hope they'll get it through the Ski Museum here. Uh, and hope everybody listening in this evening will make a nice donation to the museum to support uh, what the museum does to ski history. Uh, and it's always had a great focus on the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, <clears throat> I know your book will be a, a valued part of my own personal library at the 10th Mountain. It's a, just a tribute you did. Great service to the 10th Mountain veterans. Um, and I think with that, unless you have some party comments, I think we'll, we'll bring this to a close this evening. I just wanna thank everyone for, uh, for listening in and um, for those who support the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Um, it's a special place. Uh, I, I really enjoy going there. I, my kids love it there. Um, they have a really nice 10th Mountain Division display. A lot of the items that they uh, have on display there have Gordon Lowe written on them. Um, and he was a man that my grandfather knew when he was in the 87th. And so, um, it, yeah, it's just a really, it's a really nice place. And I, I recommend uh, sending a donation or stopping by. Great. Well, thank you, Skylar. And thank you to uh, retired Colonel Albie Lewis uh, for his participation in the story. My tonight. pleasure. And uh, thanks to Abby for organizing this. Without uh, her uh, guidance, uh, these things wouldn't be happening. So it's a huge service to the museum. And to ski history and the 10th Mountain Division history. So thanks again, Skylar. Thank you. Yeah, and have a good night. All right, well, thank you, Skylar. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Albie. Nice little surprise there. Uh, I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed this as much as I did. Don't forget, you can order a signed copy of the book on our website tonight. Those orders will ship on Monday. Um, your orders tonight actually influence how many we get. So put that in tonight. I'll ship them on Monday um, and we'll have copies in our shop next week. Uh, tomorrow night is the exhibit opening party at the museum. Our new exhibit is a solo Scott Lenhart show. Uh, Scott is a Vermont artist that has done over 55 graphics for Burton since 94. So if you're in town tomorrow night, swing by between five and eight. We're also open for the season, Thursday through Sunday, noon to five. The shop is stocked. Uh, we have tons of items that make wonderful gifts. Our online shop is also stocked, but our gift shop uh, in the museum has a few more treasures that you won't find online. Again, um, as Brian did mention, and Skylar, this time of year is so important to our fundraising efforts. So please support this series if you're able to. Um, and our year-end campaign, if you can increase your giving at all, uh, we have to raise every dollar it takes to run this organization and we're grateful for your support. Thank you all for tuning in. If I don't see you in the museum or around town in the next few weeks, have a wonderful holiday. Good night, everybody. Good night.